And a very good evening to you and welcome to Politics 101. David Hines here with you on a Thursday evening. And uh, on this, uh, uh, the ninth day of February, gosh, time is flying. February is very important for us. It's Black History Month, uh, originating in, in the United States of America. And uh, of course, it's our Heritage Month in uh, Guyana. Of course, it's the month of Master Mani, uh, the month when we celebrate the uh, coffee revolution, the 1763 revolution, which broke out in February of, nine, of 1763. It's um, important for us. Um, it's the month of carnival in Trinidad and Tobago. It's also the month of the 1970 February Revolution in Trinidad, Tobago. This month of February is an important month for us in the Caribbean, the English-speaking Caribbean. I would like to welcome everyone tonight. Welcome you to Politics 101. If you're joining us from Guyana, a very, very, very good evening to you. Good evening, Guyana, because uh, there are Guyanese from all over the country who are uh, joining us. And uh, those of you who are joining us from afar, um, meaning from outside of Guyana, welcome to Politics 101. Of course, in the United States of America, there are lots of our listeners and viewers um, in the metropolitan areas the New York metro area, the Washington DC metro area, but outside of those metropolitan areas, there are Guyanese and others who join us on a nightly basis. Uh, you know, there are the people who join us from Chicago, people of course who join us from, from Arizona. The Super Bowl is here in Arizona on Sunday and Things are moving very briskly. I was interviewed for uh, for an article that was run by the big newspaper here in Phoenix, the Arizona Republic. They had um, uh, an article on the Afro, what they call the Afro-Caribbean population here, because as you know, Rihanna is going to be singing at halftime during the Super Bowl. So we have gotten a look in at the Caribbean community here and they interviewed people in the community and um, uh, they interview interviewed me for the historical background of Caribbean migration into the United States and into uh, the area here in Phoenix, but Phoenix is a place and, um, you know, <laughs> we always have what they call the Super Bowl party. Um, uh, some friends of mine, we usually host a Super Bowl hang um, every Super Bowl. So we'll be doing that on Sunday. So welcome to those of you in Arizona who are joining us. But I did say that outside of the big areas, of course, in the United States, we do have people join us. People join us from Atlanta, Georgia. An Atlanta area is a growing West Indian population in Atlanta, and um, we keep forgetting the people in Atlanta. No, there are other places. Um, uh, in North Carolina, good evening, Brother Ozia. Ozia Morgan, um, good evening, and thanks for reminding me, thanks for reminding me, um, Brother Ozia, that um, we have people living in North Carolina. North Carolina, I have a couple of um, friends or professors um, uh, who are teaching at Duke, for example, um, and at University of North Carolina, and um, in Durham, I do have um, friends there. And I do see from time to time where people are joining us from North Carolina. 
and I want to say a special uh, good evening. Good evening to Uzi, who's joining us from Charlotte, not North Carolina. And then I want to say something about the Carolinas. And I, I, I thank you, my brother, for reminding me. Um, the Carolinas, both South and North Carolina, where they are now, has a lot of West Indian heritage. In fact, one could argue that North Carolina and South Carolina are originally barbarians, because you see um, the, they brought some barbarians, I think it was 141. You know, I haven't um, repeated this story for a long time, so the number may beat me, but they brought, uh, people from Barbados to plant rice in the Carolinas, what is now the Carolinas. Because you see the West Indians, we had rice cultivation skills. A lot of people think that it was only when the Indian Guyanese or the Indo-West Indians came after the end of slavery that rice cultivation started in Guyana Caribbean. Oh no, oh no. Africans came with rice cultivation skills across the Middle Passage, and they were brought to plant rice in the Carolinas, what is today North Carolina and South Carolina. So in many regards, the people of the Carolinas are part West Indian. That is why those islands of the Carolinas, they speak the West Indian language. Uh, because the West Indian presence in the Carolinas date back centuries, centuries, when those enslaved people from Barbados were brought to the Carolinas to start rice cultivation. They were Africans. So good evening to our brothers and sisters from North Carolina and South Carolina who are joining us. Good evening to those of you who are joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. I want to thank you all for coming on to Politics 101 and want to thank you all for your support for Politics 101. I, let's see here, the Barbadians in the UK, Sound amazingly like Bajans. Um, the, uh, no, the, the, the Bristolians, Bristol, Bristol, England, some very Barbadian. Yes, you, you, you see, the movement into the industrialized area into England. I, I had a layover, long layover in Panama once on my way, I think, from Colombia. Um, to Florida, and there was a long layover in, and, and so a couple of us drove out. And uh, there, there is a part of the Panama that is little Barbados and little Jamaica because Barbadians and, and, and Jamaicans and other West Indians, Guyanese too, went to work on the Panama Canal and settled in Panama. So you go up to parts of Panama, and there is little Barbados, there little Jamaica. And I didn't know Bristol. I knew West Indians went to Bristol. But Mia, good evening Mia, who's joining us from England. She said the Bristolians in the UK, they sound amazingly like Bajans as well. Very interesting. You see, this is what Bob Marley sang about in Exodus, the movement of job, job people. In fact, that album was Marley's best-selling album. And so our people have always been on the move, on the move, and have contributed to the history of parts of the world, have contributed to the history of the Carolinas. Because remember the Carolinas were originally occupied uh, by the native Indians. And those native Indians were pushed out of the Carolinas by an act of Congress called 
the Indian Removal Act, the 1830s. And they were pushed westwards, their lands were taken away and given via lottery to poor white men that enabled poor white men to be, become citizens of America. And the Indians were pushed westwards. That is why you have native Indians in parts of the West, parts of the Southwest, like New Mexico and Arizona and so on and Texas. And when those lands were taken, they were planting tobacco, of course, but then they began to plant rice in what is the Carolinas now. And that's where the West Indian influence in the Carolinas come from. So thank you very much, Brother Ozia, for um, drawing my attention that I forget to talk about the Carolinas and to hail up our brethren and sistren from North Carolina, South Carolina, whether you're in Durham in North Carolina, or you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, welcome to Politics 101. As I said, I have colleagues down there at Duke and uh, UNC in Charlotte. I have a couple of colleagues who teach there. Um, I know one or two of them from Guyana, one from St. Kitts. Welcome to Politics 101 if you're joining us from Canada. Welcome to Politics 101, whether you're joining from Toronto or other parts of Ottawa, or you're joining us from Montreal. Welcome to Politics 101. Are you joining us from the Caribbean? Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad. The wider Caribbean, Belize. Are you joining us from Belize? What used to be British Honduras, the only English speaking country in Central America, just as Guyana is the only English speaking country in South America. That then makes us West Indians, Caribbeans. Welcome to Politics 101. If you join us from Grenada, Welcome the Guyana cricket team is playing against the Windward Islands the second day today of that cricket match in the regional championship. Guyana in a spot of baller. The Windward Islands made 294, Guyana replied with 169. And the Windwards closed the day at 45 for two. And is somewhat behind. But if you're in Grenada, welcome to Politics 101. Some of my good friends in Grenada have visited that island so many times that people recognize me when I'm in St. George's in Grenada. Um, of course, there are a couple of television programs um, that I do that are um, broadcasted in, in Grenada, but I have been to Grenada so many times. Good evening to my colleague there, Dr. Wendy Grenade. Good evening uh, to Sister Beverly, who has one of the popular uh, television programs that I appear on from time to time. Of course, Grenada is uh, the home of the mother of Malcolm X. I had the privilege of um, going to that house, which they are maintaining in Grenada as a national symbol. Malcolm X's mother, of course, was from Grenada and his father was from St. Kitts. Malcolm X is very much West Indian and Grenada is the home of one of his parents. Good evening to you, brother Thomas, Thomas Robertson, a good family friend who I met a few weeks ago here in Arizona at a family function. Thomas and his family greeted me with so much warmth and love. A good evening, Thomas, who is joining us, and all of those who are joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, the home of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There is still Ebenezer Church there, uh, Reverend Warnock who is now Senator 
Warnock, Auburn Avenue, my first visit to Atlanta was in the year 1987. I remember it very well. And as soon as I got there, I asked to go to Ebenezer. And I was taken there by friends. And today, Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia is one of the re-migration places. You know, the movement from the south to the north into the northern city of black people. And now black people are moving back from the north to the south. And one of those destinations is, is Atlanta, Georgia. Big West Indian population, as you know, it has one of the big carnivals. You know, we are accustomed to the New York carnival and Miami carnival, but Atlanta carnival, I think about the third biggest carnival now in the United States. So if you're joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, if you join us from the South, Florida, South Carolina, welcome to Politics 101. Of course, we know that tragedy there in Memphis, Tennessee. And we do have West Indians in Memphis. They used to visit friends there in Tennessee. We would drive down from Washington, D.C. and visit Tennessee, pass through Memphis. We used to go to a place called Mount Pleasant. And every while meets with me, all oh, life, there were hunters there, West Indians, who settled in Tennessee. Welcome to Politics 101. If you're joining us from St. Kitts, Nevis, from Antigua, of course. Cricket going on in Antigua too. Jamaica is playing the Leeward Islands. Barbados is playing, sorry, Trinidad is playing Barbados. No, I got it wrong. Barbados is playing Jamaica. And Trinidad is playing against the Leeward Islands. They're in Antigua. Lots of Guyanese in Antigua. Uh, I haven't been to Antigua in a couple of years, uh, but uh, it, was, it is always a pleasure to travel through the Caribbean. If you join us from St. Lucia, one of my favorite destinations, Sister Raquel Gentle, good evening. She's part, Raquel is part St. Lucian, St. Lucian via, via marriage. If you join us from St. Lucian, Dominica, I mean, those people speak some patwa, you know, the French patwa influence. In Dominican St. Lucia, in particular, they speak it in Grenada and Caricou and so on, and the other islands, but you have to go to St. Lucia and uh, Dominica to hear the French Creole, similar to the, the Haitians, because of the French influence there in, in, in St. Lucia. St. Lucia, of course, the lands of the East Caribbean countries in terms of population, over 160,000 people in St. Lucia. Welcome if you're joining us from St. Lucia. Um, Mia, who is herself um, uh, part St. Lucian, part Guyanese. And uh, when you get into St. Lucia, you know, on a Friday afternoon, you put down your things in the hotel and you hurry down there to the Friday night jam. The Friday night jam down there in St. Lucia, where all roads lead to that Friday night jam, you, some people go up to the fishing area and sell a rare thing. Um, the home to St. Lucia, of course, is home to Darren Sammy, the former West Indies captain, the home to Derek Walcott, Nobel Prize winner for literature, the home to Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel Prize for economics. You, you understand? A small little island 
the St. Lucia, and he was set to buy four iron, producing Pastor Lewis and, 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 and Derek Walcott, two Nobel Prize winners in one little island. It is the amazing capacity of the West Indies that in this small island and mainland states that we could produce so many world-class people. The English-speaking West Indies or the Anglophone West Indies is barely five to seven million. That's it. But think of the talent that has come out of these small spaces. These small spaces. These small spaces. Think about our own Guyana. And just at the level of politics, in one generation, we could produce a Burnham, a Quayana, a, a Martin Carter. In one generation, all of them, a Chetty Jagan, all of them, Gromach, giants, you know, in one. And don't talk about our artists. Welcome to Politics 101. And I want to thank Brother Ozier for, uh, for his contribution to Politics 101, helping to keep us on the air over time. I want to thank Sister. Um, there are a few people I know that I have to thank for their contributions in recent times. Welcome to Politics 101. Welcome to Politics 101. Last night, last night, I was on Wolfspan 24, and we had a discussion there. Um, about whether it's possible to have equitable distribution of wealth under the present economic system, the present political system that we have. And we had a discussion around that. And my argument was very straightforward, that under the present political arrangement, it is very difficult if not near impossible, to have an equitable distribution of wealth. There were others who argue it's possible to have an equitable distribution of wealth under the political system that we have. My argument was that under the winner-take-all system, where you win an election, and these days we understand that you can win elections that are awarded to you, that once one party wins, it means one race wins. And to ask that party and race to distribute the wealth politically seems to be a heavy ask. A heavy ask. I've said on this program over and over again, I do not mind, I don't mind the PPP representing the people who voted for them. Joan is saying that she met uh, Sir Arthur Lewis way back in time when he was guest speaker at UG graduation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, met and took a picture with Derek Walcott when Guyana hosted Kari Festa. Yes, it was in um, first Kari Festa in 1972. And I think there was a more recent one. I can't remember the year, Joan. Uh, but yes, Arthur Lewis, in fact, Arthur Lewis or Arthur Lewis. 
was an early advisor to the Guyana government. He was an advisor to many governments. He came up with what was called the Puerto Rican model. He argued that we should develop our agriculture and use the proceeds from agriculture to develop manufacturing industry. And his theory was referred to as the Puerto Rican model because he taught at the University of Puerto Rico. And it was called industrialization by invitation. It was an early model that a lot of the early post-colonial governments in the Caribbean embraced. He taught at Princeton University and was highly regarded among economy is really won the Nobel Prize. Sir Arthur Lewis. And Sir Arthur Lewis gave a speech in 1965 on the subject that I started to talk about just now, in which he argued that the winner take all system was not going to lead to development in West Africa, where they had their ethnic problems, tribal problems. And he made reference to the West Indies, but he was talking mostly about West Africa, which have the same ethnic problems as we do in Guyana and Trinidad and so forth. And his little booklet that was produced from that speech is usually used by those of us who argue for power sharing in the Caribbean. We use Sir Arthur Lewis's little book as one of the foundation pieces of literature arguing for power sharing. And that was in 1965. Sir Arthur Lewis was very, very important and very big to the Caribbean. Of course, in 1961, Sidney King, EUC Guyana, had already argued for power sharing in a little pamphlet called Joint Premiership. It was published in The Villager, a small publication in 1961. Joint Premiership in which he argued that he anticipated the political violence that was going to engulf Guyana later on in the 60s, 61, 62, 63, 64. And Kwayana argued that we should have a joint premiership between Dr. Jagan and, and um, Mr. Burnham. And both of them rejected it, both big parties. And there was the escalation of violence. And it was only when Dr. Jagan recognized that power was being transferred away from him to Burnham, that he, he, he called on Burnham for power sharing. It was too late. It was too late. But yes, thank you very much, Joan, you're bringing back some names. Ivan Van Sortima, they came before Columbus. Ivan Van Sortima, I think he was from Bartica. And his groundbreaking work, when he started to do that work, and he argued that African people were here in the Americas long before the slave trade. And people didn't take him seriously, now the standard learning. They came before Columbus. There's no evidence that there were Africans in what we now call Guyana, the Guyanas long before the Atlantic slave trade. You know, I was teaching today in my comparative black music course, music as political discourse. I did brother uh, uh, shadow, Columbus lie, Columbus damn lie. He thought he discover somewhere else and then say he discovered the West Indies, you're damn liar. 
Shadow said, I thought Columbus, something was wrong with the head. The man didn't tell people he had to run from the Apaches. He's a damn coward. Oh, the students enjoy that. <laughs> the, the college Sonian changing the narrative about Columbus and framing Columbus as a liar, a damn liar. He had wasn't where he was mad. I think Columbus was mad. Well, you know the shadow, uh, the shadow dance jump, you know, shadow jump. You know. Uh, uh, but they came before, before Columbus, our own and Ivan Van Sortimer. Three history books that have changed the understanding of history. The understanding of the history of the Americas, the understanding of the history of enslavement. Eric Williams, they came before Columbus. Sorry, Van Sotimo, they came before Columbus. Eric Williams, capitalism and slavery, still the most authoritative economic treaties of enslavement. CLR James is black Jacobins is interpretation of the Haitian Revolution, humanizing the Haitian Revolution. These books are, 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 are now studied in the big universities. And of course, our own Walter Rodney's of Europe on the Developed Africa. Two guys, Rodney and Van Sortima. Heartbreaking breaking books on black history, and by extension, the history of the Americas and history of enslavement that you have to read. Of course, we know uh, Derek Walcott, Nobel Prize in Literature. Vidya Naipaul, Nobel Prize for Literature. And that whole generation of writers, at Naipaul and Selvon, Trinidad, met also A.J. Seymour, Guyana. Edward Braithwaite of Braffitt, Barbados. Roger Mace, Jamaica. And we can go on and on. Martin Carter from Guyana. Louis Bennett from Jamaica. Our Caribbean has made its mark on the world. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We have given the world our minds. One generation. We have given the world the mighty sparrow. And Bob Marley. One generation. And today, as they have the Super Bowl on Sunday, Rihanna will be doing our thing. Part Bajan, part Guyanese. The young man, the journalist from the Arizona Republic, did not know that little fact. <laughs> he thought she was pure Bajan. And I had to tell him, no, she's part Bajan and part Guyanese. You know, and he laughed and he said, you know, that's why you talk to professors. <laughs> Welcome to Politics 101. Good evening to you on a Thursday evening. I was saying last night, last night. Yes, Rocky, that's what um, uh, 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 Shadow sees, a damn blasted liar. Well, um, that, that's born in spare. Born in Spear sang another, um, another Columbus, <laughs> Columbus song, Columbus reggae song. Damn blasted liar, uh, damn blasted liar. Right. So both, both Born in Spear and Shadow, the Winston Bailey, singing Columbus songs. Burning Spirit is a damn blasted liar. So here we are. Here we are. Here we are. 
Here we are. You know? Here we are. If you go to Howard University, in the building, the one building that house, I don't, I haven't been to Howard, my alma mater, for so many years. But when you got to Howard, I remember getting, going there to do my master's and I eventually did my PhD. And Dr. Woodward was the professor who welcomed you. And uh, he said, I have three things to talk to you about. Two, one thing to talk to you about and two things to show you. I said, okay. He said, well, I was coming from the University of the District of Columbia. I did part of my bachelor's at home at UG. And then, you know, as we said, my mother sent for me. So I finished off at UDC, University of the District of Columbia. And then I went over to Howard um, to do my master's and, 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 um, and then my PhD. So when I went my PhD, my master's, uh, Dr. Woodward said, well, you're coming from U UDC? And I said, yes. So he said, we have had students who have come over here from UDC, but then they never went all the way to finish the PhD. So I'm challenging you to be the first student in political science from the University of the District of Columbia to finish your PhD at Howard. Um, uh, but I was more anxious about the two things. And he took me to show me the office that Eric Williams occupied, Dr. Eric Williams, when he taught at Howard. And then he took me to show me the office that Dr. Ralph Bunch, a very famous African-American political scientist, occupied. And you know, it was a joy to walk into those offices occupied by Ralph Bunch and Eric Williams. And of course, that perhaps spurred me on and eventually I became the first student in political science from UDC to finish a PhD at Howard. I didn't realize it until years after I got a call from UDC to invite me to uh, 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 an event they were having. Uh, there was another brother who went to Harvard and he became the first political scientist from UDC to graduate, for, to graduate from Harvard. And they, they had a little to do for the two of us. Um, uh, so perhaps studying in the building that housed, housed the great Eric Williams and Ralph Bunch was, uh, was, was really, and there were other Guyanese professors there who would not let me not finish my PhD. Um, uh, Professor Ralph Gomes, who's now deceased, from, from Iflot, Iflot on the West, Kashba, part of Iflot on the West Coast. He died during the COVID pandemic, so unfortunately. Um, uh, Dr. Ralph Gomes, he also ran for Guyana. I think he ran in the 1960 Pan Am Games. Um, the old timers will remember him. And then there was, uh, there was Professor Wilfred David from West Bobis. He taught, he taught in African history. He was the man who liked to talk about the Ubuntu. The Davids from El Dorado, Belladrum, um, Dr. David. That was the first man I remember as a little boy in the early 70s said, you can have growth. Without development, I remember hearing that thing about Jesus. Because the things sound so contradictory. You can have growth without development. And you're busting your little head to work it out. And I always tell Professor David, that was my first introduction to critical thinking. Critical thinking. Critical thinking. My brother Terence Blackman here, Dr. I know do you account? for our paucity of Caribbean global excellence in the last two generations. Where are our contemporary Rodney's methodologies? With Dr. Bachman, Dr. Bachman, who teaches mathematics, Omi Mama uh, at, at, at Brooklyn College there. You, you hear me say Omi Mama? Because when I was going to school, 
two things we ran away from. We ran away from mathematics and we ran away from English literature. Black boys didn't want to study English literature because he said that's for the girls. And we didn't want to go near to mathematics because it was so daunting. In those days, you had tried maths, traditional maths, and maths, and add maths, and so on and so forth. So ever since I was a child, when I hear black people are mathematicians, my skin does grow. My skin does grow, you know, um, because maths is usually gateway to the sciences, and so on and so forth. But Brother Terence, you have raised a very important question. Very important question. The answer to that question, which I'm not going to attempt to give tonight, but I'm, I'll say the answer to that question lies in a perusal of the developments in the Caribbean since the end of the Cold War in the 1980s. David Rodden, and I taught, I taught this Calypso today. He has a Calypso called 1990. And he asked in that Calypso whether the end of the Cold War will mean anything for the Caribbean and the Third World. And he asked, he said, 1990, please make a liar of me. Let me believe that there is going to be fundamental change in the region. In our Caribbean, in the third world, he brought that question of what the post 1980s was going to mean for our Caribbean. You see, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, we were engaged in turning plantations into nations, a complex undertaking. Meant that our society had to dig deep within itself in trying to shape this new society. And in the process of shaping this new society, we threw up, as we say in Guyana, we threw up men and women who symbolized that movement from plantation to nation. The white people had left and gone. And they left us sugar estates. And we had to turn sugar estates into nation. They left us with an imposed European culture. We had to out of that imposition, that cultural imposition, develop our own post-colonial culture. Our people were on the move. We had to feed clothes and house ourselves. And in the process, we are creating things. The steel pan in the 1930s, reggae in the 1950s. We are beating England at Lords in the 1950s. In those two little pals of mine, Ramadan and Valentine, beating England in England. Cricket, lovely cricket at Lord's, where I saw it. By the 1970s, we are beating everybody else in cricket for 20 years. We are people who were on the move, Dr. Blackman. You know that. And because we were on the move, we were closer to the plantation gate. We were closer to the gate of colonialism, and we wanted to cut ties with that past and create a new society. But as we got into the 1990s, we had become a little bit tired. We realized that the free education that we wanted for our children, we could not pay for it because our societies were not allowed to generate the economic sustenance for self-development. 
because we were operating on the world order that was made for us. They sat down in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire after the Second World War, and they created the new world order. And they created the Cold War. And we had to operate within that world that was not made for us. And then the end of the Cold War came in the 1980s. And as David Rudder said, the eagle was sitting on the shoulder of the bear. The eagle and the bear, which were fighting each other for 40 years. Now the eagle was sitting on the shoulder of the bear. Or is it the other way around? The eagle, of course, is the United States, and the bear is Russia. And David Rudder prophetically asked, is this the hellfire? Is this, is this a calm before the hellfire? And of course, we see what's happening in Ukraine. David Rudd in 1990 asked that question. Is it the calm or, is, or is, it, is it a calm just before the hellfire? 30 years later, we see the hellfire again. It was just a calm. <laughs> So in the last 30 years, we've been structurally adjusted again. Structurally adjusted. Our islands became islands that were meant to produce raw materials for others again. The breakup of our local economies, the embrace of neoliberalism, Dr. Blackman and I were on a program last night. And we heard that talk about neoliberalism. You see, we did not let down our bucket in the first three decades of independence. We said, no, we are not going to let down our bucket in a neo-colonial order. We want to fight neo-colonialism. But after the 1990s, we were either forced or sometimes by choice to embrace neoliberal economics. All it means is an economics in which St. Kitts with 20,000 people operates on the same playing field in China that got billions of people. That is what it means. And for some reason, we stopped dreaming after the 1980s. You know, if you were a young West Indian and you grew up with a television in your house, you assume that that television was always there. If you were a young West Indian born in the 1990s and you see your parent driving motor car, you believe that motor car was always there. Oh no, it was not always there. But being born after the 1980s, where you didn't have to struggle anymore to move from pit latrine to upstairs toilet, you didn't have to make that transfer from outside latrine to inside toilet. You begun to take certain things for granted. And then neoliberalism bought the love for money. Not love for money as community, where your foreparents pooled their money and bought land to form villages. No, it was individual money. Individualism. So we continue to produce. We produce Brian Lara, one of the greatest batsmen. But the West Indies began to lose as Lara was rising. Lara triumphs, but the West Indies begin to lose. So my brother Terence, you've raised a very important subject. Why are we not producing the same kind of collective excellence? We are producing the individual excellence. There are, there's always the child, the 24 subjects. 
at GCE or CXC. 24, in my time and your time, Brother Terence, if you get seven, that was plenty. Them little children now getting 20 something. Individual excellence. Education apartheid. If your parents can afford it, you will get 24 something. If your parents can afford it, you will get five subjects. Education apartheid. So we are producing individuals. We are producing Letitia Wright. She's done well. She went to places where can cause me. And Henry Mutu and Mark Matthews couldn't go. Where Patty Gomes couldn't go. I'm talking about our actors and actresses of the 50s, the 60s, and 70s. Letitia Wright has gone to places where other actors could not go, actors and actresses of our mother and grandmother's generation. Individual excellence. The question we must ask, why we produce Rihanna, and we produce the tissue right, and we must celebrate them. We must ask, why are we not producing the phalanx of the Leticia rights? Why are, not, why are we not producing them in the numbers? You see, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, we produce them in the numbers. Uh, I, I acted in 1972 in the first Guyanese made film. It was called Agro Seasman. I played a part in a little five minute scene. And I remember going back to Boston Secondary School and I was overjoyed. My fellow students were, I have to explain how a movie was made and so on. And out of that came a drama group. We had one of the biggest drama groups of, of any school in the country. We had about 30 something people we sing, we used to dance, sing, act at Buxton Secondary School. And we would go up and down the East Coast doing plays. Because I, I, after I was lucky to get into that film, Agro Seasman. The first Guyanese made film, 1972. We had so many actors. I mean, I was an amateur school by actor. But we had actors. Vivian Lee came later on and made a couple of other films. But now we are producing individuals. And the question is, why are we not producing the critical mass? And it is because of the segregation that occurs in our education. I could get an education, as good an education, at Boston Government Secondary School as my friends got at Bishops and QC and Saints in those days. In fact, when I go places now, people, oh, Dr. Hines, did you go to Bishops of QC? I laugh so hard. <laughs> Just to assume that if you um, are a doctor from Guyana, you must have gone to Bishop of QC. And Trinidad had the QRC and the other big schools and so on. No, no, no. I went to Buxton Secondary School, a, a, an abandoned home, or a home that was gifted to the village by a doctor. The windows were broken up and so on. The, 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 the outside wasn't painted. But I got a good education there that could lead me on to universities across the world and so forth. So what we have now are different levels of education. And so we're not producing the critical mass. We're not producing the critical mass of cricketers. 
Guyana's one university. Dr. Blackman, if all of us were to go home tomorrow, all of us professors, three quarter, 90% of us will be unemployed. University can't. And so therefore, when we come on programs like these, it's to begin to rally people to right the wrongs that are standing in our way. We can begin again to flourish in the same way. If I had anything to do with Leticia Wright, when she visited Guyana, I would take her to Denham Cell or to Sisters Village where she come from. And I would get 40 young people who would catch up with them rather than parading them for a finale and them to dress up and skin the people. I will use that oil money and invite Leticia to come back to Guyana for two months per year, for the next five years, and let her train our young people to be actors and actresses. Vision is one of the reasons my brother, Dr. Terence Blackman, that is holding us back. He share money speeches them prime ministers give him. Black Stallion. He share money speeches that them prime ministers give him. But no set of money can form a CARICOM integration unless you wrap to your people and tell them there is one race from the same place that come on the same ship and that we must push one common intention for we women and children. Whether you come from Africa or India or Madeira or China, we all come on the same ship. And our leaders want us to remain on that ship or go back on that ship. I would take some of that oil money and I would bring the teacher right. I would bring CCH Ponga of another generation of actors. And I would let her rub shoulders with Maggie Lawrence and Jumbi and them who doing acting in Guyana right now. And let she learn from the native actors and they learn from her. Where is our theater school at UG? We give the teacher right. An honorary doctorate, God bless the young woman. I will give her five more because she put us on the map. But where is the theater? Where is the Leticia Wright Theater Department at the University of Guyana? Something wrong with the heads of our leaders, and we know what's wrong. You think Orphan Ali want Guyana to be populated? by 50, 100 trained actors and actresses? Oh no, he want one to walk around the place and skinny teeth with. How do we turn one into 100 and 1,000? Sister Leticia Wright. I hope they listen and they take this step back for her to listen. Not because she's responsible, but for her to understand what they did to her when she was here. We sent our journalists to Eugene.
They study public communication. I think they have a, a diploma there. But there's no journalism degree. So our journalists don't learn to be journalists. They learn communication. Journalism is one type of communication. Often in university, you have communication school and journalism school separate. Our university needs upgrading. Five hundred bare, five hundred three hundred million or something they give to UG. What a shame! I, I, I in all my years, I'm a professor. I, everybody knows that I'm a public. I've never been invited by UG to do anything. Not one thing. Not under the coalition government, not under the PPP government. The first time I was invited was a lecturer invited me a few months ago to give a lecture on Guyana foreign policy in the post burnham years. And I was so glad it was the first time. I give guest lectures at UWIN Barbados. I give lecture, guest lectures at UWIN Trinidad and Jamaica all the time. I give guest lectures. UG, UG never invited me to Say poo. Never. And that is part of our problem. I would teach at UG for free in my summers. For free. Because I went there for two years. Guyana is my country. And I would teach at UG for free. We now have distance learning. So I don't even have to travel to Guyana. I can teach online. They never ask me to do one thing. Because they say, David, I'm you too political. We can't have you teaching our children. I teach my children and young children and black Americans. I can't teach children in Guyana. Bad minded place. Bad minded leaders, not bad minded place. Bad-minded leaders. Because I understand the rule there is that if somebody's given a guest lecture, they have to pass it with the upstairs people. In my university, if I want to bring in 10 guest lecture, bring them in a lecture, I'll pass it with nobody's me class. In UG, you gotta pass it with somebody. And of course, when they hear David Hines, they run like a curry, not David Hines. So, we are in this month of February. Last night, Terence Blackman, Dr. Blackman and I, we were on, uh, we were on this program that we are on fairly regularly, and the issue was raised. We were discussing the topic about, well, we gotta get Dr. Blackman to come on to the program here. He's a very good guy, I mean, you, you know. One of the things I'm always amazed at when I travel Guyana and I go into them villages, I'm amazed at the love that our people still have for education. I'm amazed at even young parents who themselves had to drop out of school that is still hustling to get an education for the child their children. I'm amazed at it. Because education has been one of the mediums of social advancement for our people. Without education, I wouldn't be sitting here. I don't know what I would have become. If you had come to my school, Boston Secondary School or Roman Church School there in Friendship in the Walk. And tell me that one day you will be doing a program. And people will be listening. I said, go to hell. The most I might have become as a teacher. Yeah, I think I didn't mean I could have become a teacher. And I could have worked for the government, civil servant. But beyond that, no. But here I am. 
because of education. Here, so many of you are because of education. We have to give Burnham thanks for centering education. By the 90, end of the 1980s, we compare for it. But at least those of us who got the chance in the 70s and the 80s, here we are. The same thing that uh, Errol Barrow did in Barbados and Eric Williams in Trinidad. And Michael Manley in Jamaica. And Eric Gary in Grenada. VS, VSBC board in uh, Antigua. John Compton, whatever their faults, they centered education so that two or three generations of us could face the world as educated boys and girls, men and women. Martin Cantor said, to the world of tomorrow, I turn with my strength. I come from the nigger yard of yesterday. And to the world of tomorrow, I turn with my strength. And so I'm saying, we got to get Dr. Blackman on air. He's a mat ma mathematician, but he has an analytical mind. You wouldn't know. You would have thought that he was a social scientist or so. And that is the all wrong education. We specialize in one. But we are specialists in all. You know, we used to do a subject in school called general knowledge. And you didn't know them time. General knowledge. It was across subject areas. Didn't know then it was preparing us to be generalists. My student asked me, Dr. Hines, why, why, why West Indian people, they, they, they're, they're mathematicians and they're, they're scientists and they're political scientists, and they're always quoting from some poem or from some musician and so on. What, 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 what? And I have to tell them, it's a long story. It's a long story. Operating at different levels at the same time. Operating at different levels at the same time. You live by your little yard, you have to learn to sweep inside and sweep the yard. You got to fetch water, you got to scrub the floor. When I'm taking for sale, you got to wash the clothes sometimes. You got to sun out the bedding, and you got you to do everything. Think about it. You have to take care of everything. Uh, we, we started being generalists. Today, a lot of our people, they got servants working for them. But so we were, we were talking last night about this business of, is it possible? Is it possible? Within the winner-take-all system to have an equitable distribution of wealth. I want you all to think about that. I remember last night, Dr. Terence Blackman saying that, you know, he is a pragmatist, is a pragmatist. I said, I am a radical. And I want to say to my brother that they are pragmatists who are radical and they are radical who are pragmatists. <laughs> and he did say on the program that there's not much difference between labels mean little or nothing. They are radical pragmatists and they are pragmatic liberals. We gotta get Dr. Next week, next week, we gotta get him on here. He's good. You all will like him bad. What? 
You said the body that that that, that chop body, you know, you, you you all know you all said the thing. Uh, so sisters and brothers, it's good that we 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 went into some teachings tonight and learnings. You know, um, Louis Bennett said, me learning not too good, but when we can spell, me go draw. The thing in the corner with the freckles is my heart. And the plate of yam and saltfish mean that we can never part. You see them two little thing in the corner there? Them two string is a finger with a ring, and it means I want to marry you. Now laugh after me, Kyle. Me learning not too good, but when we can't spell, me go draw. We were doing some spelling and drawing and learning and all things here tonight. And I'm so glad for the comments and um, uh, people, I took them down memory lane. Um, Dr. Blackman says here, thank you, Dr. I remember. Um, Agro sees man well. Thank you, true. They were absolutely contest here as a man. The story, Guyanese, of that value. I, um, you know, you know, yeah, Agro sees man. He was a big boy, Dr. Blackman. I thought he was a small boy. Uh, you remember Agro sees man. Yeah, it was a story about. Uh, this man who was working for a big company and he would go and pose as if he was, uh, um, you know, seizing the material. You know, when you all pay the courts, courts will send people to seize the furniture. Well, he was that man, he was a seized man, but it turned out he was a thief man. <laughs> seize the people thing and carry it and sell it. A wonderful story which reflected um, what was happening in the country at the time. And I was a little school boy. I think I must have been 11, 12 years. I remember when I carried home the money, $69.99. No, 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 no. I, I shall change myself. $99.99, 1972. Them time was one American dollar, two Guyanese dollars. When I carry and put the money in my auntie hand, she had light up big, 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 big. It's the biggest small piece me ever get. She give me a $10. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I remember that so well. Tomorrow night, Black Matters, we're going to be talking about package, and we will address that question tomorrow night. I think I have Takumo Ogunse and a couple of other people coming on I, uh, tomorrow night, and we're going to talk Black issues, and we're going to get a little bit more in that question. Thank you, Brother Ozia. Um, for coming through. Thank you. All of the people there in the Carolinas, pick yourself up and see you all tomorrow night for Black Matters. Black Matters. And I want you all to go on YouTube and like my YouTube channel. We have two channels there. Hindsight with Dr. Hines and Politics One with Dr. Hines. Please go and subscribe now to our YouTube channels just in case we get some statics with Facebook. We will be able to do our programs from YouTube. I saw um, uh, Sherrod a couple of nights ago was shut down on Facebook, but he was able to continue the show on, on, on YouTube. So please go on YouTube and like the Politics 101 channel and the Hindsight channel. And I'll see you all tomorrow night for Black Matters. Good night, love, plenty love as usual.